So that brings us to two pipe systems. And, and there's a big advantage to two pipe systems because the water to every radiator is going to be the same temperature. Look at this direct return system. The water comes out of the boiler and it goes up. And if it's 180 degree water traveling through an insulated pipe, the radiator on first floor gets 180 and so does everybody else. So that's a big advantage in a large building over, say, running baseboard if you can't go over 75, 70 feet or running diverted tees where the water keeps getting cooler and cooler, lowering the supply temperature to the, to the subsequent radiator. So we call this direct return because it's like a ladder. And the first rung on the ladder gets the, uh, the, the flow first. So it's the first to supply, the first to return. And the top rung of the ladder is the last to supply and the last to return. So in a system like this, we definitely need to have balancing valves on every circuit. Otherwise, the water is just going to go through the first floor the path of least resistance back to the circulator suction side. So that's direct return. Now, you, now look over here, you see the one return pipe. We're going to move over to reverse return and we're going to add a pipe. So the advantage of reverse return is we don't have to balance this as long as all the radiation is the same because the path to and through everything is the same distance. So the first one supplied is the last one returned. That's why it's called reverse return. The last one supplied is the first one returned. So the path to and through and back from every radiator is the same distance. So if you're working on a design and the, and the main pipe is no bigger than two inch, it usually pays to, re, to use reverse return. And if your main line is bigger than two inch, it pays to use direct return with the balancing valves. Classic two pipe stuff. Now direct return with thermostatic radiator valves. These would go here. And each one of those is going to sense the room temperature, the room air temperature, and it's going to throttle. But the challenge with this is it has no way to talk to the circulator. So I don't want these things closing and, and create a situation where I'm deadheading the pump and I'm liable to blow it up like I did on that one job on Long Island. So what we use here, or what, we, what we've traditionally used here, is a bypass line. And in the bypass line, we're going to have a differential pressure regulator, which is aptly named because it regulates differential pressure. So we set this up in the beginning so that as these thermostatic radiator valves, which are non-electric, begin to close, whatever is not flowing through that particular circuit will flow through here. So these effectively nail the circulator on a point of its performance curve, and it never moves off that point. And they're pretty simple to use. Here's one in real life. Uh, it's sort of a relief valve that, that doesn't pop open. It, it meters itself open, and it's got a knob on the top. So the way you would set this up is, is you would start out when the job was new with all the control heads removed from your thermostatic radiator valves throughout the whole building. You then set your circulator and this thing would be in the boiler room from the pump's discharge back to its suction side and you would turn this knob on the top while feeling this pipe. And as soon as you felt hot water creeping through here, you would turn the knob back and leave it like on a hair trigger. At that point, it's all set. You can put your thermostatic radiator heads on, and when any one of them shuts down, the flow that's not going through that radiator will flow across here. We don't see as many of these around anymore as we used to 10 years ago, because nowadays we've got these smart pumps that operate on ECM motors, and they know when the flow rate is not right, and they know when the pressure's building, and they just automatically sense that and slow down the flow and slow down the speed that they're running at. So they do all that automatically. But if you don't want to go for the uh, expense of the smart pumps, you can use a differential pressure regulator. It does use more electricity on the pump side, but uh, that's a trade-off. Okay, so flow rates. These are the normally accepted maximum flow rates for hydronic heating systems. And you can see this in the boiler manufacturer's equipment in the holes that they select. For instance, we looked at baseboard before, and 4 GPM would be the maximum flow that you could put through baseboard. So they list that in the catalog. They say 40,000 BTUs, that's it. If you were to look at a, at a boiler manufacturer's catalog and, and saw a boiler that was rated at, say, 450,000 BTUs, which working with the 20 degree temperature drop would be 45 gallons per minute, that boiler is going to have a two inch hole in it. So by knowing the, the flow rate and, and, the, the, and the hole size, you can understand the thinking here that it's all designed to work with this traditional 20 degree temperature drop with the great exception of the modulating condensing boilers, which have smaller holes in them. Now they do that on the manufacturing level to force you into using greater temperature drops across the system. Because when you're working with uh, mod cons or modulating condensing boilers, the cooler the return water is, 
the more condensation you're going to get out of the flue gases and the more efficient the boiler will be. But I used this trick for years when I worked in the field uh, because if, if a circulator doesn't have the labels on it, like you go on the job, there's no label on the circulator to tell you what it is, I would look at the, uh, at the flow rate based on the pipe size that was coming out of the boiler. So if a boiler had no label on it, I'd look at, if I see a two inch pipe, I know that that's probably going to be 45 gallons per minute and it's going to be 450,000 BTUs. And you know, if, whatever information you have to work with, you can confirm that. But if, if somebody called me when I worked for the pump manufacturer and said, I need a pump, I don't know what size I need. I'd say to him, well, what, what size pipe is there? And, and you know, if he says uh, a two and a half inch, size, I would size them up for 85 gallons per minute, which is the maximum flow you can flow. And I'm figuring whoever designed this job in the beginning, if if they could have got it by with a smaller size, they would have used it. So if, if I see two and a half, I'm going to size for 85 gallons per minute. And I, But you also have to know the total dynamic head. So that's based on the longest run in the system. And if the guy doesn't know what that is, I will have him measure the, uh, the, the building itself. So go outside the building and stand on the corner, measure from here to the end of the building, up to the top, over to the opposite corner, assuming this is a big cube, say, down, across, and back. That's the longest piece of pipe you could put in that building. And if the guy tells me that's 300 feet, I'm going to figure six feet of pump head for every 100 feet of pipe. That's based on the, on the resistance to flow that you would see at a flow rate that is the maximum that would fit through the pipe. So I would size for 85 gallons per minute at an 18 foot head. If there's 300 feet of pipe, I'm figuring six feet per 100 feet. And the years I worked, the 19 years I worked for the pump rep, I did that probably thousands of times and never got a pump back. And if I was looking at a pump curve and I came up with like, there's one that's bigger and one that's smaller, you know, not the exact one I want, I would consistently pick the smaller of the two. And again, it worked every time. So there's a quick and dirty way of sizing circulators for existing jobs when you don't have all the information on what's going on. You don't have the original building plans. Now, speaking of the power of the pump and measuring the longest run, which you see here, that's that high point. I want you to think in terms of the power of the pump and why, flow, why water flows the way it does. So when we leave a circulator like this and we get to that T, we're entering a T. Whatever goes into a T must come out. So here we have a, an acronym that stands for very, 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 very strong. That's what that is, the pump power right there. Now we go a little further and we lose some energy. So now we're very, very, very strong. And here we're very, very strong. Here, go with me now. Very strong and just strong. You see how the energy dissipates by friction. And then we go all the way across the top. And over here, we're uh, less strong and then even less strong and then much less strong. And then I'm getting tired, and finally, IDMA, which stands for I'm dragging my ass. Now, now, if you were the water and you had a choice of going between these two points, very, 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 very strong and very, very, very strong, or going from very, 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 very strong to I'm dragging my ass, what would you do? Yeah, I would too. I'd go this way because that's where the greatest differential pressure is. It's like putting... 30 pounds of air in your tire with a compressor that's set at 100 pounds. It's going to go ka-chunk, 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 right? But if you put 30 pounds of air in your tire with a compressor set at 31 pounds, it's going to go ka-chunk, ka-chunk. It doesn't want to go that way. It wants to go where the greatest pressure differential is, and that's between these two points. Now, I want you to notice this as you move further away from that circulator and get up here. Notice how these two points of differential pressure begin to approach each other. This is why we put balancing valves in, because as these begin to approach each other, and it's all about the delta P, the flow rate slows. Ka chunk, ka chunk. You see it? It's at the top floor. The water's moving very slowly because we're not balancing properly. And low flow means no heat, and you're going to go up there to that top floor with a key and a and a rag and a can and you're going to bleed radiators that don't have any air in them and when you bleed you won't get any air and when you don't get any air you got to know that ain't an air problem so stop bleeding 